KSFR programming and podcasts are made possible by the financial support of our listeners and by the Reva and David Logan Foundation. If this program is important to you, please consider making a contribution by clicking on the red Support the Station button at the top of our homepage at ksfr.org. Here and There with Dave Marish is funded in part by the Riva and David Logan Foundation, keeping watch for the strategies that help create a more informed and just future for all. Welcome to Here and There. We search near and far to bring you accurate, timely information about important news stories here in New Mexico and the American Southwest and there everywhere else. I'm Dave Marish. Where do rule of law people intersect most frequently with outlaws? At the bank, of course. Other than crimes of personal or political passion, the point of most illegal activities is to make money, and by and large, all the world's money, legally earned or not, flows through the world's quite connected and centralized international banking system. So your random stick-up, your big-time off-the-books oil deal, your ransomware or identity theft. The proceeds from all these crimes must and do wind up in the same international financial trough. Bankers know this, and so do heads of state and their intelligence chiefs, but for a variety of reasons they share in a global consensus that taking on the mafias, forcing criminal money out of the world banking system, would be more trouble than it's worth. One likely reason is how much doing banking business indiscriminately is worth. But an even better reason is the cost in trouble and blood of trying to eliminate a well-functioning mafia. As they say in the mafia movies and the streets of New York City, forget about it. So, we live in a world of many, many well-functioning mafias, criminal organizations tolerated in part because they usually stay within self-imposed limits. They recruit their personnel from exclusive networks based on ethnicity or clan or family. They operate, for the most part, in definable home turf, which is usually in a less developed part of the world. So far, so good. It's somebody else's problem. Until, that is, a criminal organization starts making the kind of money you eventually have to take to the bank. For most mafias, that involves profits from three kinds of illegal trafficking. Of people, of drugs, and of guns. Moving them across international borders requires a collaborative network of mafias and so-called legitimate business people and oblivious governments and, yes, safe banking havens to stash the loot. Which, by the way, moves the problem larger and closer to us. The ubiquity of mafias, the numerous nodes of a worldwide underworld, and their increasingly numerous interventions into separatist politics and wars are subjects addressed in our guest Danilo Mandic's new book, Gangsters and Other Statesmen, Mafias, Separatists, and Torn States in a Globalized World. All these mafias may share some basic characteristics, Mondich writes, but that doesn't mean they're all the same. For example, some of them subscribe entirely to separatist political movements, but others shun them because they prefer making money to making war. But once wars descend, mafias, whether they like the war or not, are great at making them turn into money-making propositions. Danilo Mandic, welcome to Here and There, and I gotta say I loved your book, which collects a lot of great war and crime reporting and organizes it into a much wider frame of history and scholarship. Welcome to Here and There. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you for your kind words. As we were remarking before we began, I think there's a very uh, good kind of elective affinity between 
your profession uh, uh, and mine, because I think people who have done field work abroad, whether as journalists or academics, can uh, find a lot of common ground uh, in understanding the uh, kind of parallel parallel societies that exist in regions like that. Well, it is in the nature of journalism to scratch the surface, but there is so much of interest and importance on the surface, uh, and all of those surficial details and a few of the connections between them, as I say, can get reframed in a much deeper and wider way uh, by scholars and historians, which is why we claim to be the first draft of history. We're pleased to leave the second, third, and final drafts uh, to scholars like yourself. The first part of Gangsters and Other States a statesman, focuses on a contrasting pair of the dominant mafia in Kosovo, which became the dominant military and political force in the country, through its separatist war against Serbia, and the cross-border mafias of Georgia and South Ossetia, which resisted both separatism and war because they preferred to make peace and money in their big black market. Let's start out in the Georgia-South Ossetia borderland region. Tell us about the local mafia organizations there. Yeah, so this is a paired comparison. I should just qualify this uh, description of yours a little bit, because I what I do is try to trace the evolving relations of organized crime to the state on the one hand and the separatist movement on the other. So things are not static. I look over a 30-year period since the uh, uh, collapse of the Soviet Union, and it is not my argument that this was always the case that the uh, organized criminal scene was uh, acting as a mediator, but this was the case towards the end, and this was a very significant uh, uh, story in the Second Georgia uh, South Ossetia War, some people call it the Georgia-Russia War. Uh, but as you say, I think it is tremendously surprising to find that organized crime is elastic enough to have such different impacts on uh, uh, very similar uh, ethnic conflicts, very similar separatist standoffs, where on the one hand in Kosovo, it can play the role of the divider and conqueror, as I call it in my uh, model, in my triadic uh, uh, model. And that in another, in another very similar case, it can play the role of the mediator. That is to say, instead of stoking further violence, promoting conflict, uh, having the perverse incentive to uh, uh, prolong conflict, to uh, 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 sell, for example, arms to all sides, to uh, pit the separatist movement from to pit the separatist movement against the host state forces, to move it from a more pacifistic, accommodating position to a militant, maximalist position. Quite apart from that, organized crime is also capable of playing the role of mediator. And this is why the South Ossetia, Georgia story is important, because there is an important lesson to be learned in the Ergneti market. The Ergneti market was a spectacular organized criminal enterprise uh, in the borderland, on the disputed border, some people call it administrative, right, between South Ossetia and Georgia. And between the First and Second uh, uh, South Ossetia Wars, there developed a, a thriving smuggling enterprise, which brought together in an open market thousands upon thousands of people to smuggle everything from, you know, uh, uh, everyday goods, food items, bushels of wheat, ranging to narcotics and uh, stolen automobiles and, and uh, uh, weapons, although they were, not the, they were mostly the exception and not the rule. And the significance of the Agneti market was that it was able to do what, uh, uh, the, what, what various uh, forces for reconciliation and multi-ethnic cooperation had failed to do for more than a decade. That is to say, they managed to bring together ordinary accessions and ordinary Georgian citizens in a black market, to be sure, but in a voluntary uh, a cooperative enterprise that did the job of reintegrating very divided ethnic communities, that did the job of uh, providing employment for uh, significant sectors of the population in a territory where uh, 
uh, uh, neither the state nor the legal private market are very good at providing employment, which created empowerment for uh, entire entire classes of people, and they were, to be sure, uh, 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 entangled with organized crime. But at the same time, they were diverted from such activities as militant agitation or terrorism or or other other uh, problematic activities. And so you have this irony that organized crime, which we traditionally think of as uh, a, uh, you know, there's a kind of securitization paradigm, which is on the one hand understandable because organized crime is indeed a uh, cancer on world institutions. It is a ecological catastrophe, if nothing else. There's a wonderful new book called uh, uh, Black Markets by Louis Shelley, which argues just the extent to which organized crime is is an ecological disaster and not just a financial or uh, ethical one, but it, that on the other hand, it can act as a peacekeeper in certain separatist contexts, in certain conditions. And what my book attempts to do is move beyond the somewhat Manichaean, somewhat simplified approach, which revolves around, you know, either demonizing the phenomenon, that's probably familiar to most of your uh, listeners, where there's this demonization. Whenever mafia's organized crime comes up, you, you got the psychopathy, the violence, oh, the corruption, right? And there's a related, the opposite extreme of that is obviously the uh, kind of, there's also a kind of romanticization of mafias, in no small part because of uh, the films that you uh, mentioned and the kind of Hollywood uh, stylization of organized crime that you mentioned in your introduction. And the romanticization goes in the other direction. It says, you know, well, these are basically benevolent social phenomena. These are a kind of coping mechanism. That uh, Mafias are kind of misunderstood, perhaps even noble actors who are the voice of the voiceless, who are the agency of uh, uh, some besieged population in, in Sarajevo that you mentioned when we were talking, for example. That there is a kind of potentially revolutionary movement for justice inside of the organized criminal patrimonial network. There's this, what Eric Hobsbawm, the Marxist uh, historian, brilliant uh, author, called Robin Hoodism, right? So you have these two extremes of the romanticization and the Robin Hoodism of organized crime on one side, and you have the demonization and the securitization on the other. And I try in my book to steer a, a more realistic and objective middle ground which tries to explore the variety of roles that mafias can play. And that's where that comparison between the Ergnetti market and the mafia separatist imbroglio in Kosovo becomes very salient. Well, the ambiguous or maybe even contradictory uh, virtues and deficits of um, the mediator mafia uh, are made clear in the Georgia South Ossetia uh, context. Um, and happily for us, uh, the central character is somebody most Americans might re remember. Um, but first off, in order to mediate between a state um, and uh, a separatist group, you you really need to have some penetration of both in order to influence both. And with that yep. penetration comes obligation. And this brings us to this once very familiar character, Eduard Shevardnadze. You may remember him as the very apparently benign foreign minister um, and uh, democratizing partner of um, of perestroika, uh, of uh, Mikhail Gorbachev in Russia. Um, and once he retired as foreign minister, Shevardnadze, who was Georgian by birth, went back to Georgia and became its chief executive. And, well, the mafia was able to mediate his activities in part because he let the mafia control a lot of his activities, no? Yes, I would. I would. Uh, I would uh, reformulate that a little bit um, to say that you know, Shevardnadze has a very bad reputation, and this is understandable. This is Georgia's only second president. This is coming at a very uh, specific moment in post-Soviet uh, Georgian history. Uh, but uh, it's fair in the contextual kind of comparative uh, uh, perspective, especially. Uh, uh, I look at 16 cases of uh, the separatist organized crime dynamic uh, across three regions, where, again, it turns out that Cervantes is not all that 
uh, uh, different from similar figures who are caught in, uh, for structural reasons, they are caught in a situation where they face the, the dilemma between a kind of totally anarchic uh, collapse on the one hand and some kind of patronizing of the black marketeers and the mafia kingpins on the other. And that decision, whether or not he's a uh, uh, very, very little love lost for, for Edward uh, Shevardnadze, but the reason that he summoned Iosiliani to help seize power, the reason that he patronized uh, black market uh, uh, figures is because they were the only avenue to finance the budding government institutions that were supposed to come out. If you have a National Guard that is controlled almost entirely by smugglers, by what are today in the literature called gangster warlords, in all the regions that you are meant to somehow uh, uh, centralize in, in some kind of law, law and order, law and order, uh, uh, constitutional uh, 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 post-Soviet situation, you are going to have to take in, you're going to have to bring the cigarette smuggling into the fold. You're going to have to bring the arms smuggling operation into the fold. And this is what Srivanaj's Ministry of Internal Affairs did. It absorbed the criminal militias into its chain of command in the hopes that it will be able to control them. Uh, in one concession, uh, notoriously, you had a commander uh, uh, in, in one of the two major uh, uh, mafia gangster squadrons who was convicted twice as a criminal within the Georgian uh, court system. He becomes a minister. Because this is the kinds of concessions that you have to make to bring the existing black market organized crime scene into the fold. You have deputies taking stakes in private businesses, in the privatization schemes that are emerging only just now beginning in Georgia in the early 90s, 92, 93, 94. And so you are trying to, uh, so to speak, fly close to the sun if you are Shevardnadze, but at the same time, you mustn't fly too close to the sun. Well, poor Shevard Nadza couldn't rule Georgia without the mafias, uh, but he also couldn't rule the mafias. That's right. That's right. So we have to give him credit where it's due and point out that he is in a similar position to uh, Milosevic, who you, you mentioned as a, as a master of, of creating such uh, uh, what I in the book call mafias in uniform. You have various figures in places like Turkey, in the struggle against Kurdish separatism, in places like Serbia, in the struggle against Croatia and Bosniak, and later, most of all, Kosovar separatism. You have people in Azerbaijan, and the recent Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, which re-erupted is another very important case study in my book, who were also in a very similar situation to Shevardnadze, where you have to create the battering ram against separatism and there are often very good reasons, and sometimes you have very little choice except to mobilize from the prisons, from the criminal underworld, from the uh, 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 rank-and-file gangsters who are racketeering neighborhood by neighborhood. We have to remember, a lot of these societies are what we might call patrimonial, what Max Weber, the sociologist, theorized as patrimonial societies. There's a patron-client networks which... Uh, uh, often mean that, you know, the state has power on paper over a certain region, over a certain province, and you have a, a threat. You have a what you perceive to be an existential separatist threat that uh, uh, Nigeria is another example with northern Nigeria and Boko Haram. On paper, you rule this territory and have what's supposedly sovereignty, but on the ground, of course, any foreign correspondent like yourself or any field worker who actually makes the effort to go very quickly uh, gets uh, disillusioned, disavows himself of this idea because you realize that the local patron client uh, uh, smugglers, the people who control checkpoints, the people who control the local criminal economy in a place where the black market and gray market economy is a majority of the economy and where the white so-called tax taxable formal economy is the exception and not the rule. 
And they have they have a, a parasitic relationship too, Danilo, because uh, the benefits of mediation um, are cross-border trade um, in South Ossetia and Georgia, not just cross-border trade, but a lot of uh, uh, advances in, in uh, civility uh, across the border between the peoples of South Ossetia and Georgia. Um, and you have a kind of structural peace but at a tremendous cost, uh, during the Shevardnadze administration, Georgia became uh, one of the smuggling capitals of the universe, um, and the white economy in Georgia shrank in relationship to the black economy. And of course, this wonderful cross-border um, flea market, Ernieti, um, mafia-dominated, peaceful, civil, commercial, drained consumers and their cash from the so-called white uh, uh, economy uh, of South Ossetia and Georgia. Why go to your local supermarket or hardware store when you can get the same products cheaper if you'll just go to that flea market on the border? So it's, it's a wonderfully ambiguous situation. Another thing that that kind of mediation creates is what a lot of legal scholars referred to as a black hole, ungoverned space, and the borderlands between Ossetia, South Ossetia and Georgia actually spawned in some ways a comically inept and unorganized criminal group, but they were dealing in possibly the single most threatening, most dangerous product on earth bomb-making materials for a nuclear mm -hmm. weapon. All That's of right. that trade really stems from the open legal non-space, if you will, that was created by the compromise of the governments of South Ossetia and Georgia and their resident organized crime networks. Yes. Well, David, you just uh, you just summarized a very important piece of my thesis better than uh, perhaps I could have. You know, there's a joke about when you when you opened and said the parasitism. You know, it's a common metaphor that leaps to mind when people describe these uh, these entanglements, and for good reason. And there's a joke in the criminology that says, you know, when mafias use the state apparatus, that's called corruption. Uh, when the state uses the mafias, that's called patriotism. <laughs> and I think there's a lot of there's a lot of truth to this. I think the specificity of these separatist conflicts is that it is very convenient to rally criminal resources, to rally black market profits, to rally uh, thugs for hire, to mobilize thugs for hire in the, under the umbrella of nationalist self-defense or conversely on the side of the separatist movement on the, under the umbrella of national liberation and patriotism. And so the kind of ideological uh, camouflage that accompanies a lot of these regions makes it very difficult for us analytically to to disentangle what what the effects actually are, and so it is no coincidence that if you look if you kind of zoom out, we've been discussing two very small, some would say minuscule cases like South Ossetia and Kosovo. If you zoom out to the macro picture and look, for example, at uh, UNODC or Interpol or other excellent data that's available out there on the global routes for drug smuggling, narcotic smuggling, migrant smuggling, weapons trafficking, right? What you find is that a majority of these uh, 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 routes are precisely going through regions that are torn by separatist conflicts. In other words, it's not a coincidence that the majority of separatist uh, uh, regions are located or one or on one or another global smuggling route. You have this major heroin smuggling conduit from Afghanistan, Pakistan, the so-called AFPAC border, which is probably the least, the least proper border in the world, the most porous border in the world, through Turkey going into Europe decades long. You have the arms trafficking flow from the ex-Soviet Eastern European uh, uh, space into Africa, into Asia. You have the migrant smuggling path from uh, from West Africa uh, through the Sahara Sahel across the Mediterranean into Europe, which incidentally was a major uh, 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 was a major precondition for the so-called refugee crisis of 2015, 16, 17. 
going into Europe, right? Well, Danilo, I, I've got to interrupt you and I've got to thank you because you've actually set up the perfect transition to the next place I want to go, which is Kosovo, um, which, um, like Georgia, is a major trans, trans uh, mission point uh, for uh, illegal products, uh, trafficked uh, people, um, weapons, and drugs. Um, and the fact that uh, South Ossetia has a Black Sea port um, and that Kosovo, through the Albanian mafias, had access to Adriatic Sea ports, uh, made them capable of an international reach, even though they were basically very local mafias. But we're going to take a look at a mafia engaged in, quote, patriotic separatism and making a ton of money out of it when we get to the KLA and Kosovo. But first, we're going to take a brief pause. This is Here and There. I'm Dave Marish. Our guest is Daniel Omandic. His excellent new book is called Gangsters and Other Statesmen, Mafia Separatists and Torn States in a Globalized World. We'll have more right after these messages. Welcome back to Here and There. I'm Dave Marish. Our guest is Danilo Mondic. His new book is Gangsters and Other Statesmen. And uh, one area in which gangsters became statesmen uh, was the tiny state or uh, autonomous territory uh, called Kosovo, uh, formerly a province of, Ser of Serbia. Uh, it fought a separatist war in the last years of the 20th century uh, and managed to separate uh, in almost every way, uh, from Serbia. And the reason they were able to do so was the existence of an extremely well-functioning and powerful local mafia. Um, the separatist movement in Kosovo had for decades been led by a really charismatic, honorable, and well-loved fellow named Ibrahim Rugova, who was a pacifist in large measure because he believed in pacifism, but in larger measure because he had no access to organized armed squads of gangsters. Therefore, in his disputes with Serbia and his requests for more autonomy for Kosovo from Serbia, he got nowhere. Then in 1997 and 98, all of a sudden, uh, Kosovo did have an armed force, and just about everybody, and I mean everybody, men, women, and babes in arms in Kosovo, knew who the KLA, the Kosovo Liberation Army, were. They were mafia. Um, and this was very important in their military uh, success, um, but it was also uh, something that had great consequences on uh, Kosovar governance and Kosovar daily life in the years since the KLA triumphed. Um, but the, the, the mafia that preceded the KLA, and by the way, provided to Kosovo eventually both a prime minister and a president, was a pretty well-functioning organized crime group before the separatist war, no? Yeah, certainly. So uh, I should say, I might surprise you now by saying that, um, contrary to convention, I'm going to actually say that what's going on today in Kosovo is actually a model success story as to how to, uh, uh, how to think about solutions to this very dangerous imbroglio of the organized crime and the ethnic grievance. And I'll, I'll try to convince you why. So first of all, of course, as you mentioned, uh, the, uh, the tragedy of Kosovo is, of course, that it has been neglected by successive international administrations, such as K4, LX. It was once a kind of pet project of uh, uh, so-called, you know, the kind of liberal interventionism. It was the shining hope for the potential for U.S.-led nation building for a new model of self-determination where the separatism can be managed within a liberal international framework. And now it has become an exemplar of the destitution, the criminality, the poverty, and the crisis of this multilateralism that was supposed to manage such places. So, for example, Europe uh, has unceremoniously deported tens of thousands of young Kosovars over the, the last 10 years of so seeking asylum. Um, 
It's the great untold story of asylum politics in Europe that all these people from within the European continent are being dumped back. Uh, Kosovar Albanians feel today humiliated and imprisoned by the EU, especially in what they perceive uh, uh, as a racist policy of denying them visa, visa uh, liberalization. This is one of Europe's poorest provinces, right? And and you know what, Danilo, in, in terms of what you were just saying, when I was there in the late 90s covering the separatist war, one of the distinctions that Kosovo had was it exported the highest percentage of its workforce outside the country of any area in Europe. So when the EU starts dumping Kosovars back into Kosovo, this is not only a humanitarian cruelty, it's an economic disaster for Kosovo. Yes, because in Europe's uh, poorest uh, country and also youngest country, Kosovo, Kosovar teenagers basically have the choice between emigrating as you, as you yourself witnessed, that's choice number one. Number two, the choice is unemployment. And number three, the choice is some kind of entanglement with the very, very highly criminalized patron uh, networks that run that province. So you have the choice of leaving or working for cocaine smugglers. I have uh, reviewed in the book a, a 20, 30 year period of the widespread corruption and organized crime there. The narco trafficking in particular has been a real cancer on Kosovo's uh, uh, potential to be a functioning uh, uh, sovereign country, which the Albanian population then surely deserves as a, as a matter of self-determination. You have out of about, as best we can tell, the estimates are difficult, but as best we can tell, you have about four tons of heroin on a monthly basis coming into Turkey, of which two tons go through Kosovo on its way to Western Europe. And this is not since yesterday. This is for a long time, and most especially since uh, the 2001 uh, 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 Afghan, Afghan uh, invasion. So you have mafia-style assassinations in Kosovo, including the recent uh, mysterious killing of Oliver Ivanovic, the opposition politician Oliver Ivanovic, who was a thorn in the back of both the uh, Belgrade uh, Serbian political elites, as well as the Kosovar authorities, because he was, in a sense, the voice for ethnic coexistence combined with a anti-corruption, anti-organized crime uh, uh, strategy. And that's unacceptable for both sides. You have ordinary people in Kosovo driving around with a screwdriver in their trunks. And so when they reach a checkpoint, they replace, they come out of the car, they take the screwdriver, and then they replace the Serbian Kosovar, uh, sorry, the Serbian license plates with the Kosovar license plates, or vice versa, on their cars, return the screwdriver to the trunk, and then cross the disputed administrative borders and the overlapping jurisdictions. It is a godsend for smuggling. And so little wonder that you have the massive smuggling rackets, Albanian and Serbian, that plague the economy. Little wonder that you have these small businesses suffering racketeering from well-connected criminals, right? And so, but why, if you just permit me one minute to argue why, in fact, it is a very positive development that we're seeing recently. You mentioned some of the, uh, uh, the luminaries, uh, the kind of criminal characters that came out of this, uh, uh, such as Hasim Tati and uh, 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 Ibrahim, uh, Ibrahim Rugova, of course, was succeeded and uh, uh, replaced by... Uh, uh, very different kinds of characters like Hashim Tachi and Ramush Haradinai, right? What's yes. hopeful is that recently Hashim Tachi has become the first president ever to resign to face charges in The Hague. All of this because of a, uh, initially based on the reports by a Swiss prosecutor called Dick Marty, who is not coincidentally a uh, mafia specialist, right? who documented in the uh, uh, early 2000s that Tachi, the, the alternatively the prime minister and president of Kosovo, uh, has, uh, that he and his associates headed what he called a mafia-like structure of organized crime, which committed murder, systematic uh, 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 racketeering and torture, numerous crimes against humanity, including an organ harvesting racket that extracted kidneys for sale on the black market, 
which is which I have a chapter about. And so this report led eventually, belatedly, to the founding of the Kosovo Specialist Chambers in The Hague. And currently we have a courtroom drama unfolding, which is very significant because previous attempts at justice were, shall we say, um, underwhelming. So, for example, Tati's comrade in arms, Ramos Karadine, was notoriously acquitted um, from similar charges at another Hague tribunal, which was also coincidentally in The Hague, but it was a different tribunal. He was acquitted in 2008 and 2012. And the reason he was acquitted is because all of the witnesses against him were systematically silenced, intimidated, and uh, murdered, assassinated by Kosovo's shadowy underworld. And this gutted the prosecution's case. So Hari denies mafia background and uh, Hashim Tachi's mafia background. And as you say, one of the things that sets them apart among mafias is that they dealt not only trafficking people, weapons and drugs, but human body parts. Um, uh, this really set them apart and makes it all the more extraordinary that Hashim Tachi was, Tachi was the guy who President Donald Trump, well acquainted with mafia. Fiosi, um, decided to make his road to the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, he was going to create um, some kind of peace agreement between Kosovo and Serbia, uh, almost all of the details of which are strongly beneficial to Serbia and detrimental to Kosovo. But Tachi, who may well have had a side deal with President Trump to sign this thing, was prepared to do so until, not coincidentally, the International Criminal court indicted him about 48 hours before he was due at the White House for the signing ceremony. Um, the signing ceremony and the whole um, nefarious agreement seemed to have disappeared. Um, but it's got to be said that unless President Trump kept his head under the covers the whole time, he, as well as his foreign policy and intelligence establishment, knew exactly the kind of criminal they were dealing with when they magnified the role of Hashim Thachi. Absolutely. And um, it's, it's, it's rare that I put myself in the position of an optimist, but the, the only thing I would add would be a note of optimism to the uh, to the uh, skepticism I read between the lines of what you just said, because it's, it may certainly be true that nothing comes of these indictments against Tachi and three other, uh, other high-ranking figures. It may, it, we may see uh, the, the precedents that we've seen, uh, one of which I mentioned, and the, the, uh, the kind of political reason to triumph over the, um, over the, the judicial one. Nevertheless, against, you know, it, against the skepticism and all the naysayers, there are, and against President Trump's team and uh, Grenell, uh, there are such people like the courageous, invest courageous American prosecutor Clint Williams, who has been pushing this thing through. Nobody expected that 20 years after the fact that any of this would, would even come to the, to the level of an indictment. The mere fact that it came to an indictment is already a, an unbelievable accomplishment. Nothing short of a miracle. Uh, because at least the specialist chambers has revived the possibility of decriminalizing Kosovar society, of purging the, the gangsters from politics. This has been the, the central problem of uh, the society. And this initiative, I think, has largely been ignored in the Western press recently. This court has largely been ignored. It's a joint venture by the U.S., the EU, and the Kosovar authorities, and various uh, investigations in the war crimes tribunal in Belgrade, which has been accumulating evidence in this regard. And so there are people beneath the, uh, the cynical and uh, conspiratorial, we might say, uh, 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 circles between, between the diplomats and the intelligence services and all the others that you mentioned. There are people working on a very good model uh, for, for on a kind of exemplary initiative for how to deal with separatist deadlocks globally. I should suggest even that Kosovo right now is a, uh, a pioneer in you know, hitting the bullseye. Because when you have this organized criminal enterprise uh, intertwined with the ethnic grievance, right, it becomes very difficult to, to break the deadlock 
because it becomes a matter of our criminals versus yours. And it becomes a matter of uh, forgiving the, the uh, in-group nationalist mafia for patriotic reasons uh, and vice versa, right? Well, you know, Kosovo is is trying to do the hardest thing in the world, which is to wean yourself of mafia influence after the mafia has not only played the crucial role in national liberation military warfare, uh, but in post-war government. And Kosovo in the last couple of years has made strides towards this. And I think uh, in a backhanded way, uh, President Trump's kiss of President Tachi, now ex-President Tachi, um, brought from the depths to the surface who Tachi was and made ignoring the case against him impossible or unpalatable for the ICC, and they acted. This shows that um, governance conveys a lot of power, influence, and money to mafias, but when mafias try to become governments, they take on some heavy burdens that can be a problem. Maybe the best example of what started out as admittedly a religiously based mafia, but obviously had ambitions to become a full-fledged religiously based nation state, was the Islamic State, ISIS, um, in Syria and Iraq. Um, and state running proved to be, again, something of a paralyzing burden to what had formerly been a, a somewhat conventional uh, mafia-organized organization. We'll get to that and the wannabe ISIS in uh, northern Nigeria, Boko Haram. But first, we're going to take another brief pause. This is Here and There. I'm Dave Marish. Our guest is Danilo Mondich. His new book is Gangsters and Other Statesmen. It's really a terrific and informative read. We'll have more right after these messages. Welcome back to Here and There. I'm Dave Marish. Our guest is Danilo Mondich. His new book is Gangsters and Other Statesmen. In your book, you make, I think, a, a, a very pertinent point that... In many ways, because they involve people with similar lifestyles, some of them chosen, other of the, others of them imposed uh, by the legitimate economy and governance, um, terrorists and criminals um, often hang out together and often share many characteristics. Um, and you make the point that the Islamic State, while always deeply based in fundamentalist Wahhabi uh, Islam, really started out to function as a pretty conventional mafia before taking over territory and, more important, taking over the administration and governance of territory became an, an alternate occupation for the Islamic State. You want to fill in some of the background on that for us, Danilo? Yes, well, I think you, you summarized the main points. I think that uh, there has been way too much emphasis on the sectarian, ideological, uh, religious component of Islamic State as a phenomenon, both in Iraq and Syria. Uh, it, is, it is unfortunate because I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned from the social science on organized crime that can shed a lot of light on uh, how ISIS grew, or Daesh, as we prefer to call it, out of courtesy, right, to our Muslim friends, of how it grew, how it came to acquire such territorial control, and how it is different from Al-Qaeda in its uh, uh, governance capacity and in its ambitions to actually have quasi-state, state-formative uh, uh, institutions, right? And so whether it's looking at the rank-and-file of Daesh in the sense, in, the, in a critical period, they were drawn, as you may know, uh, from uh, the ex-convict uh, uh, population. In the post-Saddam Hussein period, you had something like 100,000 people released from prisons, and these people didn't just have a chip on their shoulder in the kind of uh, sectarian jihadi ideological sense, but also had the know-how and uh, the human capital, if you want to call it that, they were the violent entrepreneurs. They were the thugs for hire, and they were the people who know, knew how to get things done one beating at a time. And so a lot of these rank-and-file fighters, uh, including many of the mercenaries, right, came to, came to be commanders 
and came to control the drug dealing rackets, the embezzlement rackets. Some of them were very significant as you in the millions of dollars. But of course, the big story is the inheritance from Saddam Hussein, the oil smuggling empire that he had built to circumvent the sanctions and the embargo that was imposed on him. Uh, the oil for food program, you can say a lot of things about it, but the one thing it did not successfully manage to do is to curb the, the, uh, the, the, the it's difficult to describe. It's such a massive, it's kind of a privatized national economy driven towards a, a handful of inner circle regime loyalists devoted to preserving the Hussein regime and preserving its power at the expense of everything else, including, of course, the, the, the population. That's the least of it. But it was a spectacular accomplishment in the organized criminal sense because it managed to sustain this regime under one of the most crippling sanctions regimes uh, that we have seen in the Middle East. And this infrastructure of the oil fields, of how do you extract the hydrocarbons from the ground and then how do you transport them and where are the checkpoints and who are the bribed customs officers and who are the bribed policemen and who are the administrators in various city council bureaucracies that have the power to put a stamp on something to make it legal uh, so that the smuggling is done legally instead of illegally. So that entire infrastructure did not just disappear overnight with the March 2003 uh, Anglo-American uh, invasion of Iraq. No, quite quite the opposite, Danilo, because if, if, you, if you map the invasion route of the Islamic State into Iraq, uh, the fault line that cracked Precisely. Iraq open, yes, it was Sunni territory, uh, and that these were Sunni Arabs, uh, Sunni Muslims, was correct, but less significant than the the invasion route uh, was the exact route of this oil smuggling enterprise uh, that went basically uh, from central Iraq through Fallujah and then north and west um, to Syria. Um, and this was territory that had been dominated by the oil smuggling mafias um, of Saddam Hussein, themselves a product of the first Gulf War and the attempt to uh, um, the first attempt at regime change against Saddam Hussein, um, so that uh, these smuggling routes and all of the people who worked in one way or another for this smuggling industry were both the geographical, topographical, and sociological uh, backbone uh, of the ISIS invasion of Iraq. That's exactly right. This is what I call rebel mafias in my book. And you see this in the Daesh Iraq case. You see this in the Balkans that we mentioned. You see this in Transnistria to a large extent. You see this in Azawad, also in West Africa. Um, there's a variety of places where uh, regimes create organized criminal enterprises and then lose control of them or even themselves disappear off the political scene, get toppled by force or by foreign intervention or whatever it may be. But... The, the organized criminal infrastructure takes on a life of its own and like a Frankenstein's monster continues to exist and takes over, uh, uh, is taken over by new insurgents, new uh, uh, separatist movements in this case. And so the, the Saddam Hussein smuggling uh, infrastructure was to a major extent a kind of very, very important piece of the success of dire separatism because they were the people who moved from smuggling oil in the 1990s to evade UN sanctions to now doing so for Daesh. This is tens of thousands, 50, 60,000 barrels of oil a day. This is uh, dozens of major oil fields and hundreds of little ones, which add up. This is the capacity to uh, uh, extract something like $1.3 million worth of oil revenues a day. And you can get a lot done with that. Um, and this is a pattern that we see and one of the reasons it's important to understand both for foreign policy analysis and for uh, the kind of purely sociological uh, uh, side of things to understand conflicts like this is that, you know, separatist wars like that do not tend to empower patriots and freedom fighters. They tend to empower mafias who smuggle 
the war material and the uh, 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 the most lucrative uh, resources at their disposal. And people who are able to offer their services to the highest bidder are perfectly able to shift from uh, uh, one side of the spectrum to another, from one kind of regime to another, and from one kind of sectarian story to another. Danilo, time has flown while we've been having fun. We've used all of our time because we've been having so much fun. I want to thank our guest, Danilo Mandic, and recommend to you his excellent new book, Gangsters and Other Statesmen, Mafias, Separatists, and Torn States in a Globalized World. Danilo, thanks so much for joining us. David, it was a pleasure. Thank you. That's our story for today. I'm Dave Marish. Research and production assistance for Here and There by Amy Marish, Ann Silberman, and Mary Lou Cooper. Operational control by Sean Conlon. Our theme is by Kate Powell. Here and There is a production of KSFR-FM 101.1 in Santa Fe, New Mexico. You can find program notes and listen to podcasts on our website, davemarish.com. Subscribe to Here and There on iTunes, Spotify, or Stitcher, or listen online at ksfr.org. Follow us on Twitter at Dave Marish, KSFR, and on Facebook at Here and There with Dave Marish. Join us again when next we go Here and There in search of news. Here and There is funded in part by the Riva and David Logan Foundation, keeping watch for the strategies that help create a more informed and just future for all.